we doing okay now? Yes. Okay. Okay. It, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce our grand round speaker today, uh, Dr. Joseph Howard, or Father Joseph Howard. Get used to these things. Um, this is the second time he's presenting at Medicine Grand Rounds. I think many of us enjoyed his comments last year. He's a graduate of Jesuit High School and was ordained as a priest in Shreveport. Uh, did graduate studies at, uh, in biology at LSU and in this institution. Finished his seminary work at the University of St. Thomas in Houston and St. Mary's uh, where the philosopher Dr. Joseph Graham trained him in bioethics. Uh, he has done, uh, his doctoral studies are in moral theology and bioethics from a Catholic University uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, he has served as an adjunct professor at three universities, continues to publish uh, widely, and his interests focus on the metaphysics of human beings as related to the dignity of the individual person regarding the beginning of life and the end of life clinical issues. Uh, he's been appointed director of, uh, a director of the American Bioethics Advisory Commission. Uh, he has done research in brain death, organ procurement, uh, death of the human person, uh, with many individuals across different departments in this university. Uh, and in 2011, Dr. Barish appointed uh, Father Howard to the IRB at our institution. You know, I think for me and I think for many of you, it's much easier for us to think about the pathophysiology and treatment of disease and somewhat more difficult to tackle the complex ethical issues that are so important to our profession and to society. And again, I want to thank Father Howard for agreeing to uh, give us his insights today. Thank you, Dr. Levine. It's a pleasure to be with all of you here today. In 1920, uh, there was a document, oh, excuse me, we have, we have two objectives today, hopefully in this one hour period, to evaluate if and how utilitarianism as an ethical system is present in this document I was fixing to refer to, and to compare and contrast the origin of the term utilitarianism as it has evolved over time. Um, in 1920, two scholars, Professor Carl Bending and Alfred Hoke, um, generated this document in German, Die Frage der Wernicht zu Lebens und Werten Lebens, which is translated permitting the destruction of unworthy life. And many scholars consider this document to be uh, probably the founding uh, document that started the euthanasia program in Germany. Uh, Carl Bending was a German ju jurist, a professor of law and philosophy, and Alfred Hoke was an MD, a psychiatrist. So these two scholars teamed up and generated this document that particularly um, was influential in starting the T4 Euthanasia Center. Uh, T4 was a code name for a euthanasia center uh, reflecting Tiergartenstrasse 4, and uh, these two were very instrumental, uh, particularly on, on T4. Now, <clears throat> this first section is just Professor Bending, and Bending argues that human beings are raised into existence by an irresistible force and how we deal with that is left up to each of us alone. To that extent, each of us is the sovereign of his or her life. He says it's an obscene idea to argue that a God of love could wish human beings 
not die until they undergo endless physical, psychological, and spiritual suffering. And he says that natural law would have grounds for calling the freedom to end one's life a human right. And Bending says today that there are two common notions of suicide that are both wrong. The first, that suicide is an unlawful act, a crime closely related to murder and manslaughter. Religious reasons can have no force in law because they rest on a concept that is totally unworthy of God. Also, law is secular and is directed toward the common good. And further, the New Testament says absolutely nothing about the word suicide. There are cases of altruistic suicide by psychologically healthy people that stand on the highest moral level. And there are suicides not committed by their omission that should earn moral blame. We lack all evidence to call suicide a crime and we can't treat it the same way as we would homicide and manslaughter. Point two of bending, also equally false. Thinking from natural law theory, we come to the second false notion that suicide is the exercise of a right to die. Since only killing other fellow humans is forbidden, it's inferred that persons have a right to life, a right in relation to life, and a right over life. All this thinking is headed in the wrong direction. If, however, we insist on recognizing the legality of suicide, Bending argues four points follow. One, no one can have a right to prevent suicide as a lawful act. Two, suicide has a right to self-defense in the face of an attempt to stop it. Three, all accomplices who act with the suicide express consent or also acting legally. And four, killing a patently consenting person must be considered a legal act. So then, if, if we can't consider suicide to be criminal or lawful, then we must consider it, Bending says, as legally not forbidden. Now, the conclusions that we can draw from considering it legally not forbidden are as follows. One, this only applies to the individual agent's own personal life. Two, the prohibition not to kill forbids only killing others. Three, all assistance comes under the general prohibition. Four, only the action of the victim is not forbidden. And five, since the act is not forbidden, no one may prevent his committing it as long as he's properly aware of the action he's performing. Now, the legal and social flaw in all suicides is the loss of many completely viable lives whose bearers are too comfortable or too lazy to carry their manageable life burdens any further. This must weigh heavily on evaluating the guilt of so-called accomplices. Consciously assisting those that are terminal or mortally ill take their own life is much less serious than assisting a healthy person running from creditors seeking it. And I would propose to you on my own note, this is one of the examples in my thinking of classical utilitarianism. Part two, the practice of euthanasia needs no special or should need no special legal permission. Why? Well, one, what Bending says we're doing is we're replacing a death that is inevitable uh, and painful with a less painful alternative. Two, because gravely ill patients and trauma victims face a certain death from their condition, the interval um, that exists from their condition and death caused by an interposed means should be considered clinically insignificant. Three, in a fatal threatening situation, intervent intervention changes nothing. It merely replaces the present cause of death with a different one, which has the advantage of being painless. In truth, this should be seen as a purely healing act. Eliminating pain, after all, is part of healing that physicians do. And for we're dealing, or should be dealing, with a legally permissible act of healing that benefits patients in severe pain that are terminal by eliminating the suffering for the living as long as they're alive. Truly, in Bending's mind as a German jurist, this is not a matter primarily of killing. The act must, not, the act must be considered as not legally forbidden when the law does not explicitly recognize it. Now, part three, Bending now moves to look at this 
um, in terms of a general act of permission. He says that the right to die refers not so much to a genuine right to die, but a person's claim deserving legal recognition to be released from an unbearable life, a life that one can't endure. And now he gives us several arguments historically to justify it. One, he says it's known the Romans left the killing of those who consented unpenalized. This reflects a natural law doctrine of consent of the victim and injury. Any harm done to the consenting person, including his killing, is unforbidden. Two, the movement within the legislative process begins with consent and injury, a standard in which the interest of its clearer identifiability and easier demonstration then becomes raised to quote a request for injury. Now, Bending goes on, what we really have here is the ideology that some life no longer merits strict absolute protection legally and the request to destroy it should find greater legal consideration than should the request to destroy robust life. Again, I would add on my own note this again seems to be fitting quite consistently with the classical doctrine of utilitarianism. Part four, Bending's now going to address to us in particular three categories of human beings that would be subjected um, for quote the benefit end quote of euthanasia. But Bending begins before naming the three groups to ask this question. Are there not some human lives which have so completely lost the attribute of legal status that continuing them permanently loses all value, both for the bearer of the individual life and for society. Now, Bending recognizes that merely asking this question was going to invoke discomfort and uneasy feelings in anyone who's unaccustomed to assessing the value of individual life for the bearer and for society as a whole. It hurts one to see how wastefully we handle some of the most valuable lives and how much labor, power, capital, and patience we expend in squandering lives that are, quote, not worth living and have become worthless until nature without pity intervenes and stops such lives from being continued. Bending says, consider this scenario. Reflect on a, a, a simultaneous situation on a battlefield strewn with thousands of dead young people or a mine in which methane gas has trapped hundreds of energetic workers and compare this with our own mental institutions in Germany and the caring for all of the inmates. One will be deeply shaken by the strident clash between the sacrifice of the finest flower of humanity in its full measure on one side and the meticulous care shown to existences which are not just absolutely worthless but even a negative value to the individual and society as a whole. It's impossible to doubt that there are living people to whom death would be a release and would simultaneously free society and the state from carrying such a ridiculous burden, which serves no conceivable purpose at all. Permitting termination of such lives frees everyone involved. The classical principle of the toleration of a lesser evil to avoid a greater evil. And again, I would interject, this seems to me to be, reflect the classical doctrine of radical utilitarianism. Every unforbidden killing of a third person must be experienced as a release, at least by the victim. And now the three groups he proposes that are candidates to be euthanized. One, those composed of irretrievably lost functions that due to an illness or injury fully understand their situation clinically and have expressed directly their urgent wish for release. Examples, terminal cancer, untreatable tuberculosis, those mortally wounded, those in unbearable pain, and those with painless hopelessness. Bending says, I can find not the least reason legally, socially, or ethically not to permit those requested to do so to kill such hopeless cases who urgently ask for and beg for death. Indeed, I consider this permission to be a duty of legal mercy. Category two, the second group consists of incurable idiots, no matter whether they are so congenitally or have become so, paralytics, etc., who in the final stage of suffering 
they have neither the will to live nor to die. So in their case, there's no valid consent to be obtained to be killed. However, on the other hand, the act encounters no will to live which must be broken. So their life is completely with no meaning, no purpose. They don't experience it as unbearable. They're, they are a fearfully he heavy burden for their families and society, and their death does not create loss in any sense except for perhaps a mother or nurse. Since they require extensive care, they occasion the development of professions devoted to providing years and decades of clinical care and service for absolutely worthless, valueless lives. It is, it, it is that this is an incredible absurdity and a misuse of resources for unworthy ends of life's powers. I find no grounds, Professor Bending says, for not permitting the killing of these people who are, quote, the fearsome counter image of true humanity and who arouse horror in nearly everyone who meets them, end quote. Category three, those mentally sound people who through some event, like a very severe fatal wound, have become unconscious, who if they should ever awake again to consciousness would awake to nameless suffering. In my mind, this brings to thought cases of Nancy Beth Cruzan, PVS in Missouri, and Terry Chavo in our country. When the consent of the hopelessly ill is missing, one proceeds out of, quote, sympathy, end quote, in order to spare one of a fearful end. We're not trying to rob him or her of life. Only those persons can be candidates for having their deaths permitted who are terminally ill, who in addition to being beyond help, either requested death or consented to the dying, or we have some sort of evidence they would have requested or consented to it had they not fallen into a state of permanent unconsciousness. Methodology. For those three categories, Bending proposes, one, the establishment of a government board must be required that is separate from the state because the state should never take the initiative itself in mercy killings. Two, the initiative must take the form of an application, an application for permission. Three, this board must investigate, do the presuppositions for permission, are they met for terminal illness, for being an incurable idiot, etc. The board must have permission involving a physician for bodily disease, a psychiatrist for mental illness, a lawyer, and unanimity should be required. Four, the decree itself must only state that after a thorough clinical investigation on the basis of current scientific data, the patient seems beyond help. There's no reason to doubt the sincerity of their consent. We find no impediment in the way of killing the patient. The petitioner is entrusted with bringing about the patient's release from his evil situation in the most expedient, efficacious manner. The act of euthanasia must be considered a consequence of free sympathy for the patient, and the final release must be completely painless, and only qualified persons will be justified in applying the lethal means. We're faced with a choice, a dilemma, Bending argues. Because of practical difficulties, one without pity consigns the incurable to continue his suffering to the bitter end, forcing the family and the physician despite their sympathy, to complete passivity. Or, one does not forbid the accomplices the risk of satisfying themselves about the condition of unforbidden killing and acting on the best advice of their conscience. Obviously, Bending is arguing in support of position number two. What about error? Bending says some will argue that a diagnosis of incurability is uncertain. I know just in the last five years, the clinical paradigm for PVS patients was always they have no understanding, they have no awareness of their surroundings. Four or five years ago, the New England Journal reported, for example, um, that about five or so patients out of 50, a small number, that were put into functional MRIs and asked questions about things they previously had known, areas of the brain lit up, seemingly implying some form of, of cognition. 
So paradigms can change over time. But error, Bending says, is, is possible in all of our actions. And no one draws the false conclusion that because we make an error occasionally in some field, we must forego all useful activity in that field. Is preserving always really a life, a blessing in an absolute sense for those, say, from severe illness? Should we really labor to preserve lives of negative value for whose extinction, Bending says, every reasonable person must hope, not granting release by gentle death to the incurable who long for it. This is no longer sympathy. This is its opposite, its antithesis. Now, in this German document, Permitting the Destruction of Unworthy Life, we move to the second essay by Professor Alfred Hope, a psychiatrist in Germany collaborating with Bending. Dr. Hoke argues that everyone tacitly, legally, under certain conditions is allowed to um, infringe upon the lives of others in narrowly defined circumstances. For example, um, Hoke presents the case of uh, someone in ob -Gen that may terminate a pregnancy uh, to save the life of the mother when there's a conflict with a maternal fetal conflict. Now, these situations, Hoke says, are not clinically expressed in German law, but they're recognized tacitly and implicitly. They're expressly permitted. For example, he says, we know in surgery that all surgical procedures, there will be a certain percentage of fatal outcomes. But even though it's a, a small number, we don't you know, forbid surgery because of that. And Hoke says, I recall a child that was dying with a rare brain disorder and I knew the child would die within 24 hours, and I wanted to keep the child in the hospital so we could dissect the child at autopsy. But the father insisted adamantly that we take the child home to die. And I knew that if we allowed that, we would lose that chance for a dissection. I could have very easily hastened the death with morphine sulfate. How many lives could I have not saved if I'd hastened the death, Hope argued, with morphine sulfate dissected the child at autopsy and gained knowledge to save others. Again, he didn't do that, but I would interject on my comments, this again appears to me to be the classical doctrine of utilitarianism. Physicians, Hoke says, recognize a fundal, fundamental obligation to preserve the lives of their patients. Yet, there's no absolute relation to this obligation in every single circumstance. It's a relative alterable one when new conditions, new data, new theories and new questions arrive. MDs would undoubtedly find their consciences lightened if they no longer found themselves constrained and oppressed by a categorical absolute commandment to preserve every single life unconditionally. If pushed to the extreme, the implicit valid principles of medical ethics and duty which require the greatest continuation of life becomes utter nonsense. Now benefit becomes burden. Is there human life, Hope asked, which is so utterly forfeited its claim to worth that continuing it has forever lost all value for the bearer of that life and for society? Now, Dr. Hope presents two groups similar to Bending's that should be considered as candidates for euthanasia. Number one, those where mental death develops later in life. Examples of that would include, in his mind, senile degeneration, dementia, paralytica, arteriosclerotic changes in the brain, premature processes of insanity, etc. And category two, congenital brain damage in early childhood, exemplified by gross deformities of the brain, mental retardation, epileptic seizures, or other motor stimulus pathologies. Economically, Dr. Hoke argues, complete idiots who perfectly fulfill all criteria for mental death are the ones whose existence weighs most heavily on the German state. If we calculate the total number of idiots presently cared for in German institutions, there are about 20 to 30,000. If we assume an average life expectancy 
of about 50 years, it's easy to estimate the net, uh, what incredible amount of, the, of capital is withdrawn from our nation's wealth for food, clothing, heating, all for unproductive purposes. And add to that the staff, the caretakers of thousands that must be withdrawn from beneficial work to work for those whose lives have a completely fruitless endeavor. In all cases of worthlessness resulting from mental death, one finds a contradiction, Hoke says, between the individual's subjective claim to life and the objective expediency that is necessary. We must remember that the state, the civil organism, is a whole and with its own laws and rights in just the same way as an independent human organism where we as physicians regularly sacrifice an individual part or segment that is pathological or worthless or harmful to preserve the whole. We must get to the point that eliminating the completely mentally dead is no longer a crime. It's not considered emotional cruelty, but a permissible and a useful act. The mentally dead individual has the character of a foreign body in a social system. He or she lacks any productive accomplishments and lives in a condition of total helplessness requiring constant care by others. Regarding the inner state of those with mental death, what criteria does Hope propose? First, there are no clear ideas, feelings, acts of the will, no possibility they can arise. No possibility of awakening to a world of consciousness and no emotional links to the environment. But the most essential argument Hope proposes is the complete impossibility of cognizing one's own personality, the absence of self-consciousness. This, this, the mentally dead, such persons stand on an intellectual plane that we rediscover only far down, he says, in the animal kingdom. A mentally dead person is unable to inwardly to make any subjective claim to life. Eliminating such an individual cannot be equated to other killings. Even legally, a human life, when it's taken, is by no means always the same moral or legal act. Motive and circumstance factor in in the classification and analysis of whether we describe the moral act as homicide, manslaughter, negligence, dueling versus killing on request. Mentally dead persons are unable to make Pope says, a subjective claim to any sort of right or a right to life, no injury could have been done to such a person's subjective rights. Now, on the inner state of the mentally dead, he, Hoke argues it's wrong to act toward them from a point of view of sympathy. Sympathy for lives not worth living is based on the same error that leads people to project their own thoughts and feelings onto other living beings. Such, quote, sympathy, end quote, is the last emotional response which is relevant to life or death of a mentally dead person when, because where there's no suffering, Hoke argues, there can be no sympathy. The consciousness of the meaninglessness of merely individual existence when compared with the interests of the whole the feeling of one's absolute obligation for integrating and using every power and discarding all useless tasks, the feeling of being totally responsible for a participant in a difficult and painful undertaking, these must become in the future a part of a common understanding to a much greater extent than they are today before any ideas presented here can receive complete recognition. Does the selection of lives which have become worthless for the individual and society make certain that mistakes or errors will be excluded? Hoke argues only for laypersons can this be addressed because for physicians there's not the slightest question that with our selection this can be carried out with certainty, 100% accuracy, high degree that can be found in any other part of society. For physicians, there are many indisputable scientific criteria established which guarantee us the impossibility of uh, recovery for mentally dead persons. Assembling a board is needed to test the situation with perfect precision. 
and hope concludes, a new age indeed will arrive. We're upon a new era, operating with a higher degree of morality and with great sacrifice, where we will actually give up the requirements of an exaggerated humanism and an over-evaluation of simple, mere existence. This is the end of Bending and Hoke's document. At this time throughout the world, um, we have several countries where euthanasia is legal, and we have four states in our country um, with other states on the judicial docket to argue their cases. Um, but probably one of the um, most studied uh, practices of euthanasia for the last 20 years has been the Netherlands. Um, we continue to collect empirical data from 20 years to observe how that process operates. And if you look at this uh, particular slide right here, you, you, this is just active euthanasia and it's divided into two broad categories. Voluntary, meaning the patient has knowledge and consent, and involuntary. And this slide here, excuse me, is only for 1990, okay? And if you look at this, you will note that the total number of voluntary cases of active euthanasia in 1990 in the Netherlands was 5,859. 5 the active number of involuntary cases, okay, and again I want to emphasize here where the patient doesn't have knowledge and has not consented in 1990 um, was 5,941. Now this original data concerned us greatly because one of the safeguards that had been promised was that the system had so many checks and balances and safeguards that people who had not had knowledge and not consented would not be candidates. And obviously this slide shows the opposite. But as we trace this from 1990 in Lancet in a study through 2010 in the Netherlands, we're going to see some altering figures. Now, one of the problems we have that what y'all have as clinical physicians and we have as moral theologians is how to describe the nature of a moral action. In other words, when a physician is titrating a opioid or a drug and something happens, you know, how do we describe the moral act? And I'm not prepared at this moment to talk about the principle of double effect, but there's a century old ethics principle of double effect that we can talk about at the question period if you want, that, you know, morally covers bringing people relief if the titrations have to be slightly increased and they may hasten death as long as it's not directly willed. It may be foreseen, but it's the only way to bring about comfort. But the late um, English philosopher, one of my favorites from Cambridge, Gertrude Elizabeth Margaret Anscombe, argued in her famous work of 1957 that when we are sitting back observing an external action morally of another person, if we're just bystanders, it's almost impossible to be able to judge the metaphysical intentionality of that person. Put in clinical terms, if you as a physician have written orders on a chart for morphine and no one knows anything else and simply is look, another MD looks at that chart and knows nothing about the patient or anything, it's almost impossible for that second physician with no other knowledge of the patient to have a valid objective knowledge of the true intention of the prescriber's morphine sulfate. Because you're looking at trying to judge someone's motive or intentionality. And without more data being revealed, it's, it's almost impossible. So The Lancet several years ago published a study looking at the Netherlands from 1990 to 2010. And they'd sent out questionnaires that said four things. Basically, you know, um, are you withholding or withdrawing treatment? Are you taking into account the possibility of death? Are you indirectly hastening? Are you directly hastening? So a questionnaire with, with four questions was sent out trying to understand from a clinician's perspective what he or she thinks they're doing in certain situations. And this is what was reported. 
Table 1. The frequency of euthanasia increased between 05 and 2010, and the frequency of assisted suicide remained low over the years. The increase in euthanasia reflects an increase in the number of requests for euthanasia and the proportion of the request granted. Frequency of ending life without an explicit patient request decreased over the years of all deaths in 90 to 2010, unlike what we saw on my first slide from 1990. The increase of continuous deep sedation uh, until death in 7% of deaths where the patient um, had euthanasia requests not granted, the patient hastened death him or herself. Table two, euthanasia and assisted suicide most often involve younger people, those with cancer, and patients who had it were attended to by general practitioners. So younger people, those less than 65, and it occurred more with general practitioners than clinical specialists. Table three, the most important reason um, the physician gave for granting euthanasia requests were wish of the patient, no prospect of improvement, no more options for treatment, and loss of dignity. And finally, in table four, questionnaires asked the physician who did this, um, did you or did you not report this to the euthanasia committee? The understanding in the Netherlands being that if reporting it in no way uh, should jeopardize or threaten the uh, role of the physician. And the reporting rate in 2010 is comparable to that in 05 and higher than the reporting rate before enactment of the law in 02. One second. Thank you. Now that we've gone over all of this um, data, let's take a, a thorough look in the time we have left of the beginning of the term utilitarianism and how it's evolved over time and how it has a clinical relationship. Jeremy Bentham coined the term. Um, Bentham. Um, lived 1748 to 1832, and um, Bentham had one very interesting human trait. He was particularly sensitive to suffering of people and animals, and he argued that living beings are governed by the principle for the search for pleasure and to avoid pain at all cost. Bentham elevated his position as a hypothesis to natural law and basically proclaim the principle of utility, the word utility coming from utilitarianism, as the only valid principle of morality. Actions are morally good, he argued, that increase the sum net of happiness, and they're bad that increase suffering. Coming after Bentham, one of his followers, um, John Stuart Mill. Mill had always idolized Bentham, and Mill's original contribution, his treatise on liberty, is an outstanding work to read. In this book, Mill argues that the, neither the state nor society or neighbors should interfere with what an individual is doing as long as a person doesn't injure another, but only him or herself. Several variants of this version of utilitarianism have been developed. One of them, for example, is preferential utilitarianism, recommends making people happy, not after a universal pattern, but in accord with each individual's own subjective preference. The utilitarian of rule postulates that not so much our own uh, in our acts should we follow the rules, but um, if you look, for example, at negative utilitarianism, um, this focus is not so much on increasing pleasure or happiness, but avoiding or minimizing suffering. And there are other theories and variants from uh, the original use of Bentham's utilitarianism that out of constraint for time, we must move on and have a contemporary example from Professor Peter Singer. Singer is a philosopher at Princeton. He holds the R. DeCamp Chair of Philosophy
and bioethics. He came to Princeton in the late 90s from Melbourne, Australia. Singer is undoubtedly a brilliant philosopher who captivates collegians and probably the most significant utilitarian that exists in the world today. Singer's uh, work, Practical Ethics, has two editions. And Singer makes the following arguments. Um, the moral order is to be concerned with sentient beings, only those that are capable of experiencing pain <coughs> or pleasure. Uh, actions are morally right when they increase happiness for the greatest possible number and wrong when they do the contra. Murder is wrong because the pleasure of the killer, Singer says, is outweighed by the suffering of the victim. The loss of future pleasure and the grief of the family and anxiety caused to those who knew him. But what if somebody who could expect only further suffering is instantly killed in his sleep in total secrecy then the classical utilitarian could find no reason to condemn the act. Animals, particularly those with a nervous system that are similar to eyes, also experience pain and suffering or pleasure. Therefore, Singer says we must consider them just like we do our own. Singer rejects the doctrine of speciesism which looks at Homo sapiens as being superior to other animals and says that it is on unfounded and morally untenable principles. The intensity of doing wrong to a conscious animal that can experience pleasure or pain involves consciousness. For example, he says chim chimpanzees and gorillas taught a sign language recall facts from the past have a certain, and this is a loaded topic, awareness of an identity. And Singer's thesis that ties all of his works together, he's very well published, comes out now, not all persons are members of Homo sapiens and not all members of Homo sapiens are persons. In other words, Singer would argue that Terry Chavo and Nancy Cruzan are members of Homo sapiens or not, while well, they're members of Homo sapiens, they're not persons, but we could take Coco the baboon, who's perfectly normal, sentient in consciousness, Coco the baboon is not a member of Homo sapiens, but Singer would redefine that animal to be a person. Morally praiseworthy results can be achieved only by increasing to all animals happiness, diminishing suffering of already existing beings, and increasing the number of happy beings and reducing the number of unhappy ones. Causing death by omission in uh, in connection with euthanasia, Singer should have no problem with that. But then he tells us that we are guilty of murder if we fail to donate a sufficient part of our income to third world countries where millions are dying prematurely due to horrific starvation, malnutrition, and disease. It's interesting to note that early on in Singer's um, publications, he really, at best, had a very sketchy command of using biological, medical, or clinical data. And, and at one point he had written that animals did not have a cerebral cortex. I think that was in his 1979 edition, and that was largely corrected in his 1993 uh, edition of Practical Ethics. But, you know, Singer derides the idea that euthanasia could ever be performed without a person's consent and denies that such a practice has occurred at all in the Netherlands. And while the data is, uh, moves back and forth, we saw in 1990 that there were large numbers of cases of that. Um, when Singer issued his first edition in 79 of Practical Ethics, he offended many, many readers. He demeaned in the first edition people with Down syndrome, calling them vegetables, and he assessed the mind of a one-year-old child to be, in many cases, below that of many animals. There was an uproar. Among his statements that caused concern in the first edition, Singer said that um, the Nazis committed horrendous crimes, but that doesn't mean that everything the Nazis did was horrendous. 
we can't condemn euthanasia just because the Nazis did it any more than we can condemn the building of new roads for the same reason. Now, let's go back to 1979 in that first edition. We've already talked about Bending and Hulk in that first document and the T4 project of the, of the German Reich, Tiergartenstrasse 4. In the 79 edition, Singer didn't see particularly anything horrendous about the Nazi euthanasia program housed at T4. Yet psychiatric patients who guessed or had found out, they knew what awaited them. They yelled loudly, they begged not to go, they tried to defend themselves, they fled and hid themselves, they had to be dragged from the building. In Asperg, a hundred feeble mind human beings, human persons, had to, they resisted and had to be loaded with physical force onto buses. At these centers, these innocent human beings, human persons, were gassed with carbon monoxide. It took about an hour to cause death in this way. Human persons were crowded into closed chambers, experienced extreme horror and terror, and suffered visibly before they died. Doctors and attendants liked to observe the scene through a reinforced glass aperture. These atrocities provoked widespread indignation in Germany, and not only among families of victims and the public, but in the Wehrmacht and the Nazi party on August 28, 41, Hitler had to order a halt on the T4 project. A number of doctors, nurses, and medical personnel who gained experience in the program were later transferred to death camps and involved in killing innocent persons. Now, I'm not proposing necessarily that Singer was cynical or sarcastic in his first edition in 79. I think he was probably biased and engaged in psychological rationalization and ignored the true objective facts because of his general preference for euthanasia. That's my own personal hypothesis. All criticism on principle to which utilitarianism has been subjected for almost two centuries and which utilitarians were never able to refute applies to Singer. Is it true that nature has placed us under the government of only two sovereign masters, pleasure and pain? I would propose no. And even the very dichotomy of pleasure and pain is really false. Why? Because everything that is important in one of our lives as a human being growing up, learning, loving others, marriage, giving birth, parenthood, creativity, ambition, struggle, motivation, all of this in our lives brings about an admixture of happiness and sorrow, pain and pleasure, inseparably tied together. And most people by no means shun these um, and strivings, rather they seek them passionately. People often act out of a sense of duty by standing up against injustice. They risk their own lives for the lives of others. They toil and mortify themselves in such a perfection. And none of these endeavors fits the utilitarian's description of the human being, the human person. I would propose the utilitarian doctrine completely disregards the true, real contents of a human person's life. You know, John Rawls correctly pointed out that in the pursuit and Rawls is an American philosopher, of the greatest happiness for the greatest number, utilitarianism justifies the sacrifice of the innocent for the general welfare. Let's note, this very theory, this moral principle, can be used to justify extreme acts of violence. Why not have lynching and cannibalism, which allows the villagers to enjoy the nutritive and magic properties of the organs of the one sacrifice? Not so, not so, assures us, John Stuart Mill and Peter Singer. Justice takes precedence over utility. Not that justice truly does derive from any other source than utility in Singer's mind, providing this, quote, sense of security. But what I would argue is that if justice is not an independent principle and is reduced and grounded only on the principle of utility, then the protection it claims to lend is false, invalid, and unreliable. You know, it's probably Singer's defense of animals that has brought him such an attraction of so many, so many followers. But let's think of his logic for a moment. At present, there may be some frogs that are uh, threatened with extinction, 
but why should we protect them if they essentially have an extremely low level of consciousness? Why shouldn't we exterminate some fish or burrowing rodents which don't have a memory of the past or no awareness of their own? It's often been argued that utilitarianism is a parasitic philosophy because it subsists on criticizing other ethical systems. Singer excels in pointing out inconsistencies in intuitive and theological ethics. But it's the reason utilitarian ethics that always, to me, seems to largely fall and fail. Why is happiness of the greatest number the standard? Reason can also justify the exact opposite. For example, why not happiness for me and misery for everybody else? I personally completely have an understanding and appreciation for Singer's appeal to never torment animals. And Singer would argue, if possible, to avoid killing them. But I would propose that we don't owe it to animals in the same exact way we owe it to ourselves. Why? Animals are objects of a moral order, but it's a moral order they haven't created, and one that by nature they are properly incapable of obeying. So I think that while Singer's thesis and his utilitarian ethic is very popular, when we really unpack it and understand it, not only applied to euthanasia, but across the line in moral reasoning, there are very, very significant pitfalls. And one of the reasons for that is um, the relationship that we have between um, utilitarianism and what I would propose egoism and subjectivism. In thinking through this critically, it seems to me that utilitarianism is a thorough program that is grounded in various forms of egoism because only the individual ego can decide what pleasure is pleasurable. And it would seem to me that a philosophy of egoism originates and is grounded in a philosophy of subjectivism, often radical subjectivism, the problem being um, that there's an inability or rejection of conforming to any notion of an order of objective truth. In closing, a, and I can't get my slide pulled up here, but it is here somewhere. Um, a European journal in psychiatry recently did a study, and there have been very few studies that have looked at the issue of what impact does it have psychologically and in psychiatry on family members or friends witnessing an assisted suicide. They only looked in Switzerland at 85 cases, but what they found that caught my attention was this. About 20% of those 85 people that witnessed a loved one undergo consented assisted suicide suffered clinical negative effects, either full-blown PTSD, subthreshold, or complicated grief. Now, while we're just beginning to, for the data to start coming in, this small study caught my attention and in one sense didn't surprise me. So, in conclusion, I would suggest that while utilitarianism is a very prevalent ethic in the West and indeed the world today, it is often grounded with serious problems of inconsistencies in reasoning and something that we should be very cautious of. And I think that this uh, study in psychiatry and uh, the European uh, Journal of Psychiatry uh, is just beginning to gather with a small sample granted data to show the effects can be extended to even those uh, who are witnessing the Assisted Suicide Act. Thank you for your time and attention. <laughs> Questions, comments? Yes. Washington, Washington State, State. State, not the District of Columbia. No. Um, they're uh, practicing euthanasia. Yes. So, on what basis um, are they practicing Okay, euthanasia? each of the four states are regulated differently. Um, the first one to start was Oregon, and I can refer you to some literature. Dr. Kathleen Foley at Sloan Kettering is probably um, in palliative care, the, uh, one of the top authorities who has studied the Oregon situation. The other three states followed after it.
So we, I, I personally don't possess any current empirical data on those three, but we have a wealth of the system in Oregon. So I can give you that information before you leave. What are your personal views on uh, I'm, I'm going to stand behind what Kathleen Foley says at Sloan Kettering. We have the ability today in medicine, or you have the ability as physicians, in every clinical situation to titrate appropriately. No one today has to die a death in unbearable, intractable pain. Now, does that mean every physician knows how to do it and every patient gets it? No, it does not. But Foley at a crossroad, who I'm gonna support, argues, instead of training medical students and residents and fellows to kill, let's continue to do fellowships and train you men and women to become experts in pain management and palliative care. Foley says the two top diseases that are most difficult to manage are probably metastatic cancer in the bone and Lou Gehrig's. But she is adamant that you guys have the ability, even in those two, that no one has to die a death in unbearable pain. And that's one of the top reasons people request suicide, is they fear intractable, unbearable pain. Good question. Other questions or comments? Very good. Thank you.